So hello there and welcome to the Assignment Journey podcast. This podcast is a series of episodes where we discuss the assignment from when you first get it to when you submit it. So in this episode, we're going to be discussing what you do when you first get the assignment brief and when you first get given the assignment question. So what your first steps are. So I'm Alex Wood. I am a member of the skills team and I'll be the host during these podcasts. And with me today is special guest Naomi Bowers Joseph. Hello. So Naomi has lots of experience. She is the senior skills officer and has done a master's and also an undergraduate degree. So as I said, this podcast is all about the first thing you do when you're given an assignment. So a lot of students come to us as a skills team and ask, I don't know where to start. What do I need to do? What should my first steps be? So Naomi... If you've been given an assignment, what are your first steps? So I was thinking about this in preparation for the podcast, and I have to say my first step is a mild panic. <laughs> Not a major panic, <laughs> but a mild panic. Um, and so my second step, which I think is probably what you mean by the question, yes. my second step after the mild panic is it's whatever is going to keep the, make that panic better. So generally it's going to be um, for me, that's practical details. When is it due in? How much? How long have I got until it's due in? How many words is it? Um, is there anything horribly frightening looking at me from what I need to do? And get, really get those practical details in place because that's going to make me feel better about it. So it's all about getting your head around it and trying to work out what you need to do so that you can then get on to do it. You're looking at what the challenges are. Yes, like I say, particularly the practical details is what I'd focus on. Yeah. So I'd want to know when is that due in? How far away is that? Do I have anything coming up between now and then? Um, that kind of detail would be... So essentially, you start planning it then, really? Like I say, my first step would be the practical details. My second step would be looking at what the actual question was. Yeah. So what I would do is I would have a look at what makes the assignment unique. I, I try and think about what I need to demonstrate and think about, how, okay, how can I demonstrate that and where do I go from here? So it's all about working out how I can adapt my own practices to the individual assignment. And so I start really looking at the assignment brief and looking at the question. So as well as me and Naomi saying what we would do, uh, we've gone out and asked students what is the first thing that they do when they are given an assignment brief? Read the instructions very well. If there's anything I'm not quite sure about, I go and ask the lecturer to clarify. And then I begin my research. The first thing I would do would be to structure how I would want the essay to look once it's prepared. Well, if it's a multiple choice assignment where you get to choose your own questions, I'll go for the one that I'm more comfortable for, the one where I know more about and one that I know I have an argument already. I'll read the assignment brief, look at the marking scheme for it, see what they're asking, um, and then I'll start making a basic plan and then a research plan. I read through the assignment, highlight the most important parts and make a plan from that. So there you go. So Naomi. What were your thoughts on the students' opinions on how to start an assignment? I thought there was actually quite a lot of different things they were saying this time. Sometimes when we ask students, and when we ask students, we get similar ideas coming through. But actually, I thought there was quite a lot of different things. And I think it that leads into how people approach assignments generally. People do come at it from different directions. And there's no right or wrong way of doing it. It's what works for different people. So there was one chap there saying that he st structures the whole assignment into what the what he wants the final structure to be, whereas mm. other people are going straight to the brief and picking out things from there. I think it's it's interesting. I know one of the interesting things that we picked up is, late, that comes later in the podcast, in a, a later part, is about whether students research beforehand. And a lot of students are conflicted about whether they research or they just put a structure and that student is an example of that. I think what the student exemplified, though, is that a lot of the time they do read the instructions first. I think mm. three of those students said about reading the assignment brief or reading the question and trying to get their head around what is required of them. And I think that is one of the most crucial things there that the students have agreed with Naomi and myself on is getting your head around the question. So they use the term, use the assignment brief. So Naomi, what actually is an assignment brief? 
So your assignment brief is the further details and information that you get over and above the, just a straight question. Yes. So it will include things like so it will include things like the deadline. Um, it will have a choice of questions if you've got questions to choose from, as one of the um, students talked about. It will include anything particular that they want that your lecturer wants into that assignment. Um, that general context information almost. So it's quite useful there, isn't it? I think when I've been looking at assignment briefs, it's given me the extra details. It's also told me off, quite often what type of, what the learning outcomes are. Mm. So often I've said that actually we expect, you to, we expect you to include this or that, or we expect you to critically analyse this. And so by using your assignment brief, you can really get your head around what type of things are expected from you. Again, I was thinking about this when we were preparing and Whoever set your assignment wants you to do as well as you can. Yeah. No one's setting an assignment thinking, oh, this will trick everybody. I'm going to ask them for X, but I'm not going to tell them about it. I'm only going to tell them Y. Um, no, that's not what's happening. Whoever set the assignment and writing the assignment brief wants you to get those marks. They want you to hit those learning outcomes. They want you to hit that marking criteria. So all that information you're being given is what's going to help you do that. So not everyone has a strict assignment brief, but often there are assignment briefs in other forms. So sometimes they aren't just strictly a document with all the extra information. Often the assignment brief can come from a presentation slide in your class or what questions you can ask your lecturers in advance to try and work it out. So for, for example, are, do your, what does the word count include? Is there 10%? Would you, what would you want me to demonstrate? Things like that you can... Almost ask When you say, like is that. there 10%, what do you mean by that? Oh, okay. Is there a 10% extra word count? Oh, I see. Which is always a crucial thing, especially for me, because I would always recommend using the full 10% extra word count. So using your side brief, do you think that you can tailor your work using it all, Naomi? So, yes, when you're, like I say, the assignment brief is there to help you do as well in the assignment as you can. So the more you can look at what's being asked of you and do those things, the better you're going to do overall. So yeah, I think it's crucial to adapt from your style to what they want from you. I know one thing that is crucial though, it's as soon as you've read the assignment brief, as soon as you know what criteria they want from you, that's only one of the two steps that are key to understanding what's needed from you in that individual assignment question. The second part of it is about understanding the question itself. And so that is one of the most crucial things. I'll give you a reason why. During my second year, actually during my first year, one of the modules that I did, I was told actually I had written an excellent piece, but it hadn't answered the question that they wanted. I hadn't included half the information. And that's because I hadn't spent the time understanding the question. I only spent actually a day on it and I got my worst ever mark. And that was all because of the fact that I hadn't properly gone and spent some time trying to work out what they wanted from me. So now that you've read your assignment brief, how can you go about understanding the question, Naomi? I think it's really key that you thoroughly read the question and pick out the different kinds of um, instruction words that are in there. So there will be words in that question that tell you what is being expected of you. So some of them might be um, action words. So are you being asked to compare? Are you being asked to contrast? Are you being asked to describe? These are all different things and you need to work out which one's there. You also need to work out um, the context of the question. So what um, are you being asked to write about? What's the topic? Are there any individuals? So are you being asked to talk about something from the perspective of a certain person or certain group of people or the perspective of a certain theory. These are all really key things to pick out. I think the student that talked about highlighting um, in those student mm. voices, that's a really good idea. Even if it's just on the question itself, highlight every word. You might end up with a lot of the, lot of the question highlighted. Maybe different colours if that's the way your mind works, yes. Um, to really pick out those really key things. So what I do exactly that, actually. So I highlight in one colour the key question terms, so terms like Naomi said, contrast or critical analyze. And then I also then write out, highlight the subject specific ones that are trying to identify things that we could include in our work. They are the words that are crucial 
to actually the content of your essay that you need to include. So you might be being asked to talk about something in a particular location, yeah. so a particular country, for example. That's really relevant. If you do a wonderful assignment, but you've based it in Ameri- um, talking about an American context when you should be talking about a mm. British context, that's going to be that's going to hurt your mark. So that's really key to establish right at the beginning. So you've highlighted the words, but now what? So what I would do after highlighting them is I would go and define them. So there is a resource available on our skills guide that is not actually the university's. Yes, it's unfortunate it's not ours really. But there's a resource available on our skills guide that does define a number of the key terms. And there are also there's also a great book in the library called the Study Skills Handbook. Alternatively, to those two resources, you can just Google the word and you can or use any other browser and you can then try and find out what the word means and then once you've done that start writing it into your work but as the defined version so for example critically evaluate means look through it pick out some weaknesses and, and advantages and weigh those up and come to a judgment so if you then write that instead of the word critically evaluate the question starts to become more and more clear what we'd recommend is with the subject specific words is I would take those and I would start defining what they mean and do a mind map of them and think what could they include that word and then start putting those new words into that question so then the question becomes bigger and bigger and includes what my essay is more like what do you think I w- it would never have occurred to me to do that but I think that sounds that sounds like a really good idea I think I'd be worried that my question would get so big that I wouldn't, I'd get lost in it. So because I like lists and bullet points, I'd probably bullet be bullet pointing at that stage, the yeah. different key things. I think a key thing to mention as well is that if there are particularly subject specific words or words that you think might have a different meaning in the context of your subject and you're not sure what they mean, then do go back and check with your lecturer because they're that subject expert. And also check your lecture slides as well to see if there's content in those areas. Mm-hmm. And that's where you start to build from there. And that's when you start to go from a question to your research. So one thing as well that Cottrell recommends is she recommends reading the title aloud very slowly a few times because apparently that's one way that you can help absorb the title. Is that in the Studies to Girls Handbook? It is. Yeah. Reading it, so we talked about reading aloud in our latest live stream. We could have included that. We could, but I hadn't read that at the time. No. I read that yesterday. Hmm. when researching this podcast but um, the benefits of reading aloud are quite big if you want to find more information about that go to the YouTube channel that is linked in the description of this podcast so now that we have discussed our advice for breaking down and understanding the question let's do it practically so let's. you've not seen this example Naomi I have not I am going to give Naomi a example question I made based upon some of my previous experiences as, as a student but key, but keyly, not a not a past question. And Naomi will have a look at it, and we'll try and break it down together to see what it means. So let me get the question up. So the question is: Can I just say my first answer to when you get a question and um, what would I do was that I would have a mild panic. I'm just looking at this question that Alex has written for us to talk about, and I feel like having a mild cry. I don't know. About <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Anyway, carry on, Alex. <laughs> So the question that we've got is critically evaluate the options available to a company in dismissing members of their works of their workforce. Analyze the rights and remedies that may be available to any dismissed employees and the likelihood of any claim against the company succeeding. With reference to theories, statutes and case law. It's a jolly topic. And I think again we should talk about this in the context of me being Alex's line manager. (laughs) Okay. This changes things. <laughs> um, so what we've got here, here, Naomi, so first of all, what's the first thing you'd like to unpick about it? Um, those action words. So we've got critically evaluate, we've got analyse in there. Um, I'll stop highlighting actually because that causes noise. But yes. So I think those are the two key ones, aren't they? Critically evaluate and also analyse. So this is going to be um, a... A, a, a complex assignment, actually. I think yes. being asked to both critically evaluate and analyse, because they are two different things. And so when I'm, when I'm writing this assignment, I'm going to need to make sure that I do both of those things. 
So really, they're two separate sides of this assignment. So the first side is, okay, so what options do they have available? And to make a judgment about them options. Yes, yeah, so the first part of the question, so talking about the subject now, the first part of the question is the options available to a company. So that's from the point of view of the company. And then the second part of the question is about the dismissed employees. So really key to pick out that, that difference so again, like I said, this, I hope we've got a long word count for this, um, I mean, Alex. I had 1,500 words for a similar one. Oh gosh, that's not much at all. Like I said, there's a lot going on here. Um, so I would take it from what the key thing about the second half is, by analysing it, it's about having a look at both sides. So if you're on the company's side, do you, do you go into the... Do you think about actually what's the cheapest way of getting rid of them or do you think about what's the best for publicity and so there's lots of things to weigh up there and so by going through the key words in there that's when we can start working out what's, what we might need so already we've split it up into two halves and evaluate the two buzzwords definitely else? the last bit so there's a comma and then the last bit of the last sentence is with reference to theory statutes and case law I would almost take that out and put it to one side when I was thinking about the question Yeah, I'm going to think about what I need to write in answer to the, those two parts of the questions. And then I would want to make sure that I was bringing in theory, statutes and case law all the way through. So I would take that out of the question. But may, um, but then when I'm looking through it, either looking through my plan or proofreading the final thing, coming back and saying, have I talked about theories? Have I talked about statutes? Have I talked about case law? Because that's really specific. Mm -hmm. If my lecturer is telling me that they want reference to theory, statutes and case law, I need to make sure that I've got some theories in there, that I've got some statutes in there, and I've got some case law in there. So another thing that we've got in this particular thing that we're analysing is the word dismissing. And so immediately an alarm bells are ringing. I'm thinking, okay, it says about what options are there. So I then will go back to my slide, lecture slides and I'll have a look, okay, what have we discussed in lecture? Are the options available? I can then have a look at my textbook and saying, okay, what options are available? And I can keep going open here and defining what are the options available. And then I can start weighing up each option and thinking about in each scenario, which is different. So actually this question most likely would come with a scenario below it, but I didn't write one for the sake of this. Um, but it's good to then, from what we've done already, we've broken it down, we've got an idea of what our next steps are and we'll be able to use our understanding of the question to take us to the next part and work out some, just almost a, some parts of the structure and some parts of where our next research steps are. The other thing we've got here is analyse the rights and remedies. So again, that's two different things. So I would think maybe um, when you see the word and, that's something really, that's a, it's a word that you might gloss over. Yeah. But actually that word and is telling us something really important. We want rights and remedies. It's not rights or remedies, it's rights and remedies. So again, we need to know A, what they are, B, what the difference is between them, and C, we need to make sure that we include both of those in Yes. Our answer. So what I think is crucial is doing a bit like Cottrell said and reading it very slowly mm. and a few times so that you can absorb each word and understand what the implications are and what's required. And I'd recommend doing that, actually, reading through it a few times just so that you can make sure you have put your head around it in the right way and you're not going one way when it wants you to go another. Can we talk a little bit about proofreading at this point as well? If because you I want. know it, does it come later on in the series? So does proofreading come, will come more in depth later in the series, but we can talk about it slightly now. We like to talk about proofreading and because it's actually such a key skill and there's so we say this all the time in all the different things we do, so much involved in proofreading. And one of the things that you can do in proofreading, so when you have dissected your question in the way that we're talking about, you've made your notes, you've done your highlighting, all this kind of stuff, keep that keep what that record of your breakdown of the question mm. because when you come to proofread yes. it, you can think about, have I done these things? So like I was saying, have I talked about theories? Have I talked about statutes? Have I talked about case law? Have I analysed? Have I critically evaluated? Have I talked about the rights and the remedies? Have I talked about the company's point of view? Have I talked about the employee's point of view? All these questions... Because you've got your notes from this initial breakdown that you're doing now, you can then ask yourself when you're proofreading um, and really make sure that you're hitting all the elements of this question. I'm glad that you brought that in because in the proofreading podcast that's going to come later, one of the fundamental things I'm going to talk about is how you will go back and you'll use this understanding, understanding the question. Ultimately, this is the key part to 
passing and doing well with your assignment. Because like I said earlier, if you don't, no matter how well you write, if you don't do what they want you to do, don't include the things they want you to do, you won't get the marks. And so the understanding of the question underpins everything. So it underpins the direction that you go in your research. It underpins your structure. It underpins what you write. So it is crucial that you do spend the time now having a look and break it down, just like Naomi's done just with this mock question. If you enter a competition for who can draw the best pot plant and you put in a beautiful drawing of a bowl of fruit, it might be the best drawing of a bowl of fruit there ever was, but if it's not a pot plant, it's not going to win the competition. Yes. And with that interesting <laughs> tangent... <laughs> this is why he invites me along. Yes. It's uh, for gold like that. And with that interesting tangent... Now, I'm just going to say that the podcast is beginning to close. The next episode of the podcast, if you are interested follow it to follow the structure, is all about structuring your assignment. So you, you understand the question now. Now, how do you turn that into a structure? And how do you plan your next steps in your research? Do I don't you... think I'm in that one, am I? Alex has managed to find someone else for that one. So, so I'm not in that one. No, but you'll be welcome back later in the season, especially when we talk about proofreading. Excellent. So thank you very much, Naomi, for coming along. You are very welcome. Uh, thank you, audience, for watching. And thank you to all the students who helped us with the student voices. Their voices are very much appreciated and help make this podcast. So thank you very much. And we'll see you in another podcast or YouTube episode.